So today we'll, we'll look at the sense of balance. Um, and we saw last week that the, the, there was this structure called the cochlea. And attached to it is, is another structure um, that uh, is involved in balance. And both of these are part of what's called the bony labyrinth. And it's sort of, you can imagine inside your ear here, as you pass through it, you, f you find within this bone a series of tunnels. And it's within these tunnels that you find these two structures. And the, the tunnels that we're talking about today are lined with a membrane. And on one side of the membrane, you've got perilymph. And on the other side, you have endolymph. And um, the, f the first one, perilymph, is si similar to extracellular fluid. Whereas the endolymph is similar to intracellular fluid. That is, it's high in potassium and low in sodium. Um, and it's the endolymph that bathes the hair cells uh, that we'll be talking about today. And it has this positive 80 millivolt charge with respect to the parallel. Now, the reason both these structures are close together is because they evolved with this thing on the side of the fish here called the lateral line system, the lateral line organ. And what this, this is just a tube running down the side of the fish and water flows through it as the fish moves through its environment and pushes against hair cells that are located here. And this water can be moved by either of two things, either the fish moving through the, the, the environment or some sort of disturbance within the water, such as a sound. So the same, uh, that's why the same structure became sensitive to both these modalities, both um, the sound and movement. Now, within the, the labyrinth, this, the part of the labyrinth of the vestibular system that we'll talk about today, there are two parts. One are the canals, and those are important to sense your rotation. So my head's rotating from side to side. Okay, so that's rotation. And that's more rotating up and down, or funny ways like to the side. The other thing can be translation. So that's moving in a straight line. So if I were to move forward or backwards in my chair here, or, or from side to side. And the other thing that, uh, instead of moving in a straight line, that these sense is your sense of gravity. They also sense which way down is. So you know uh, how to remain upright standing on, on, on your head or upside down. Now, within the otoliths, there are two parts again, if you're dividing in two throughout this early part of the lecture. And on it, within it, this is, you can think of as a egg. And on the inside of this egg, you have this two parts. This, the ma there's a macula here in green and a macula here in blue. And on these macula protruding inside this egg um, are hair cells. And you have thousands of them in each of these structures. Now, 
on top of the hairs. Um, you can imagine somebody sort of poured jello over the whole thing. And the hairs are embedded in this jello. And then on top of the jello, they um, spread stones made of calcium carbonate. And um, those stones add weight to this jello so that when you move, this has a mass and tries to stay still. So when your head goes one direction, these hair cells get bent in the opposite direction. And these hairs have a particular shape, um, like we saw before with the auditory system. They have a tall one, and that's called the conicillium, and then shorter one. Now, again, as before, um, there's little strings attached to each hair, which then open up the top of, of the flap of the adjacent hair, and the potassium flows into the cell. And it actually gets pushed into the cell because potassium is positive, but this whole thing is charged to plus 80 millivolts. So the inside of the cell is more negative than here, and, and that pushes potassium into uh, the cell. And then when potassium enters the cell, it depolarizes the cell, and uh, that produces release of transmitter, and then that transmitter uh, causes this eighth nerve afferent to depolarize and produce action potentials that go down to um, the brainstem. Okay, so here you can see the firing rate of this eighth nerve afferent. And you can see that, first of all, it's constantly active. There's no, at no point is it silent. So what it, what's happening is that on top of a constant firing rate, you get an increase and a decrease of the firing rate. And that depends on which way this hair is bent. So it's when it's bent in this direction, those flaps open and, and the firing rate is high. When it's bent in this direction, the flaps are closed and the voltage is, the firing frequency is low. Now again, you can see that this, this is occurring sort of uh, every time you, your head translates forward and backward. But it can also happen if you bend your head up and down, and that changes where gravity is. And as a consequence, this thing also senses which way down is. how your head is tilted with respect to gravity. Now, within each of these macula, um, you have hairs pointing in every possible direction. You can imagine there's a sheet here, another sheet here, and it protruding out of it, so this is the top of one hair cell, and this is the conicillium here, and this arrow indicates the, where the conicillium is. So the conicillium is over here for this hair cell, and so forth. So you have every direction. Now this utricle here is located here with respect to the head. So it's horizontal. So it can sense this is horizontal. So when your head goes forward, backwards, you've got, you're measuring uh, the, the activity of this one and this one, and then you can go from side to side, and then you're measuring the activity of these ones. Okay. So you, you measure the your movement left, right, forward, backward. This one here, that's the sacule. The sacule, you can see, is in the vertical plane, and so it can, it like the other one, can measure. Have these hair cells sense 
forward or backwards, but these ones now measure whether you move it up or down. Okay. So we'll, the next part we'll do is, is, is look at the semicircular canals. We've got three canals on each side. We've got an anterior, a horizontal, and a posterior. And the horizontal is in the, the horizontal plane. So it's, it's, like you can see here. The other two canals are vertical with respect to the horizontal canal. And they're perpendicular roughly to each other. So you can imagine, you, you can place a cube here and these three canals will form three of the sides of the cube. Now, within the canal is a widening. It's called the ampulla. And within this widening is sort of like a, a membrane, it's a pliable membrane called the cupola, and that seals this um, widening. And there are hair cells that, that are inside this cupola. So when you rotate your head back to, to side, from side to side, these, the fluid inside your semicircular canals pushes on your cupola and bends your hair cells and makes them fire more or less. Now, each canal prefers a certain direction, so that it's oriented so all the tiny cilium, the longest hairs, are in a particular direction to cause it to increase its firing rate. So, the, it's easy to remember the canal on the right increases for you turning to the right. Oops, this is the right. Okay, so. Okay, so here I am, I'm turning to the right, and I increase, and at the same time, when I turn this way, this canal goes in the opposite direction, and it decreases. Then when I turn this way, well, my left canal now goes to the left, <coughs> it increases in firing rate. The so right canal turning to the right, or left canal, horizontal canal turning to the left, but those are both it's, it, it, the directions they prefer. Now, what about the other canals? Well, this, these two are easy because each of these canals get activated when your head nose goes down. But you notice it's not quite the same direction, these two head rotations. In one case, it's nose down and to the left, and it's here it's nose down and to the right. Okay. These canals, it's nose up, the posterior canals. So it's back of the head down, you know. So it's easy to remember that these vertical canals, they, they, whatever you tip the head, these guys are forward, so you tip your head, top of your head down, these guys are behind, so you tip the back of your head down. Now the only thing is this funny angle, so why is this different from this? Oops, wrong now, from this, okay? So, what, what they're trying to do is this canal is in the same plane as this canal. So the posterior, posterior canal on this side is in the same plane as here. Now, you can see that each canal has a pair it's associated with. So the horizontal canals are paired left and right. The vertical canals 
are paired to the one on the opposite side and behind. So the anterior one here is on the same plane as the one over here. So the, they're all push-pull. When one gets activated, increases in firing rate, the pair, the other one in the pair, decreases in activity. Okay, so why, what is it trying to do? Well, it, all these canals drive reflexes that help you when, when, whenever you turn your head left or right or, or you, when you do translations. The, canal, the canals, the horizontal canals here, turn your eyes. One of the reflexes that they turn is that of your eyes. They also project down the spinal cord and uh, contract your legs to keep you upright when you're standing. We'll see in a moment. Um, so here you can see the head's rotating one direction and the other part direction. But the VOR is working perfectly, and you know it's working perfectly because the eyes are still. They're pointing straight ahead. So the perfect v vestibular ocular reflex, which is the name of this reflex that drives this movement of the eyes, is that the eyes are still. Why keep the eyes still? Well, what you want, whatever it is that th this head is looking at, you want its image stationary on the back of the eye. So if you keep the eyes still in space, then that image will be still. So this thing is sort of like a stabilizing system. Um, it keeps, no matter what you're doing with your head, it keeps your eyes stable with respect to the world that you're looking at. And therefore, the image clear on your eyes. Now, that cell phone, that red cell phone of mine from the room there, um, the, the, uh, Apple is, uh, one of the advertisements about it is that it's it's the the, the six uh, uh, plus and it has a um, a lens that rotates uh, so it's a little thicker than the cheaper lens uh, camera and so the, the the lens of the camera actually rotates whenever uh, the iPad or uh, iPhone senses that that you've rotated the camera's rotated. And therefore, the image is, again, stationary on the back of the, the camera. So the, this, the, the stabilization system of the, the modern cameras do the same thing as the VOR. Now, the reflex that does this is, is a, a simple one. You've got... Um, starts off with your hair cells, then your eighth nerve, which synapses on the vestibular nucleus, a, 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 a neuron in the vestibular nucleus, which crosses over to the opposite side of the brainstem and innervates one of two neurons. One here innervates the motor neurons of this muscle on this side of the eye, and over here on this muscle on this side of the eye. Okay. So why is it doing that? Well, you can see here, when the head rotates, it activates, as I said, you turn to the right, this canal, the hair cells, and this canal will become more active. This more, greater activity is going to be sent down this pathway and this muscle and this muscle contract and that will counteract the rotation of the head if the eye turns in the opposite direction. Yes? Yes, this, this from the vestibular nucleus you can also, you also get projections down to the spinal cord. 
and that keeps contracts your leg muscles and keeps you upright. Okay, at the same time, you can see where the rotation starts here. The activity here decreases. So the, the push-pull pair, the horizontal canal on this side is the push-pull pair. Activity decreases. There's less activity going to this muscle and this muscle, and that at the that allows both these muscles to relax and not impede the rotation that the other two muscles are trying to initiate. Now, visual input normally assists the VOR. Um, so, during normal um, head rotations, uh, first of all, you try to stabilize the image. Here's the normal one. So the head moves this way, the eye rotates this way, and what it I then sees is this nice steel stationary image of the sea. Okay, so normally, if it works perfectly, this is what you see. But if there's any slip here, it's counteracted by something called the optokinetic response, and that comes in through the eye. Retinal slip comes through the eye to to to. To, we'll see later to area MT and then um, a long pathway, which we'll discuss next, next week. Okay, um, you can get the camera ready. If I could film you guys doing this exercise, okay? So you can all stand up and stand on, when I tell you go, you stand on one foot and you try to remain standing for as long as you can. One, two, three, go. standing for one more thing. Okay, just that keep your eyes open, but again, on one foot when I say go. Okay. One, two, three, go. And stare at the screen. <laughs> yeah, the screen, well, not too bad. I expected more, I guess if it was a bigger screen. Slightly, slightly more unstable. Okay. Th thank you. Sit down. So, if the screen was bigger, like if you went to, to the uh, something like uh, Silver City, and you got a right up a, a front seat, um, you would whenever the screen went this way, you would feel that you're moving to, in the direction it was moving. Or in the opposite direction, I should say. Uh, but because the screen wasn't that big, I should have had a, I had you all crowd the screen. See how that went. Okay, so let's 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 do this this thing. What modalities contribute to maintaining one's balance while standing upright? Uh, the vestibular system. Yes. Okay. Um, what about your sense of touch. No. Yes. 
Um, okay, we've got some yes and some no. The answer is yes. Uh, you, you've got, um, um, on the soles of your feet, you have pressure sensors. Um, and they detect whether or not you're pressing on, on, on the, your heel or on your toes more. And they help uh, do a spinal reflex that will keep your legs can, or muscles contracted appropriately and uh, keep you standing. What about this? Oops. Yes. Okay. Again, if you stretch the muscle that uh, keeps, you, keeps you standing, that'll again contract it and it'll stabilize it, maintain the position. As a, no vision, vision is no? Oh, it's yes. It's yes, you, 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 uh, you, 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 the reason you, you should remember that is when you closed your eyes, you were far less, more unstable. Okay? So when you closed your eyes, you fell over quicker. That meant when your eyes are open, it's helping you. Okay? Well, that, that's important to remember. Now, auditory system, I, I think it, 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 it depends, you know, um, on what the sound was. And if you could somehow, if the sound indicated where the world is or something like that, and you can use it to stabilize as well. Yes, you have a question. Can you talk about the physiological factors for this perception or a balance? Balance. No, we haven't talked about the pathway. Okay. No, we'll we'll talk about it I believe next week. Yeah. Okay. But I, I just mentioned it briefly that that again uh, if if you have retinal slip, it'll go through area MT. It'll involve MT. Okay, why do we get dizzy? Well, here you can see um, a little bit uh, um, speeded up. You've got to pull, this is, this, um, this is the time you're rotating your head, okay? And when you start rotating, you get a push on your uh, cupola. But as you maintain that rotation, the cupola gradually springs back to its normal upright position. And even though you keep rotating, the, the cupola is back in its upright position, so it's telling you that you're still. Okay? So there's no more firing coming for, from your cupola for a very prolonged rotation. Now, what happens when you open your eyes during a prolonged rotation? Let's say, let's say your eyes were, you closed your eyes, you started turning around and around. Okay? Well, you're here, you're turning, you would open your eyes and you would see the world turning. Okay? And you, but at the same time, your pupil is telling you, you're not turning. Okay? You have to, so you have this conflict. Vision is telling you you're turning, the pupil is telling you you're not turning. So you feel dizzy. So it's when you have these conflicts. That uh, now, often your VOR isn't perfect. It isn't one. So every time you do turn your head, you do have a little bit of retinal slip, and that initiates um, the optokinetic reflex. And that optokinetic reflex helps stabilize your image. But it takes a bit of time to do that. And at the same time, if you're, um, let's say, uh, sitting in your car and you see the car in front of you uh, move away, you think sometimes that you're rolling backwards. Or if you're on a subway car and the subway car next, subway train next to you, starts to move, you think it's your train that has started moving. So this, this reflex can give you the sense of motion when you're in fact 
not not moving. So here's the VOR coming down to the, from from the from the vestibular organs, and as we talked about, um, the cupola gets pushed and then gradually comes back to its normal position. So it doesn't last a long time, the signal from it. At the same time, we mentioned that there's a, if there's a, a, a slip on the retina, it takes a little bit of time to get going, because it I've got to go through area, the eye, then area MT, then a lot of places in between. So this signal is sluggish. But that's okay that it's sluggish, because you've got a very quick, quick signal coming from the vestibular afflicts. And so the, these two signals cooperate with each other to help each of the, each of, each of the, um, the VOR get as perfect as it can. Now, what's this lady trying to do? Okay, it's a ballet dancer. And, and she avoids being dizzy by suppressing the signals from her inner ear to her brain. Who says that's the answer? Hit the table as hard as you can. No. Provides a fixation focus for the eyes. Okay. Possibly. Preventing the head from turning continuously. Okay. I would say that's the answer, but so, yeah, yes, the, 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 the dancer is spotting, so she's attending, attempting to fixate a single spot, but that's not what's preventing her dizziness. Okay. By doing that, okay, you can see that, 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 that as she rotates, she keeps the same, she keeps her head on the same location, and then quickly, as the, as the body's almost turned around, she quickly snaps her head around back to the same same target. Okay, that way she prevents the canals from having any long period of continuous rotation. She gets the spot, tries to keep it so the head steady, stationary, and then when it's you know turned as far as it can, she snaps it around all the way around, and again catches the spot. Okay. Now, you get motion sick often. Um, what's that produced by? Well, here you can see a boat going up and down because of waves. And you can see a person here, and this, this diagram is intended to represent this person inside his cabin. So here he has a conflict. The brain has a conflict. His visual system tells him he's, the room is moving with him. So there's no visual signal that he's moving. But his vestibular system tells him he's going up and down. So there's a conflict between these two systems. And as a consequence, um, this conflict produces the sense of nausea. Um, to avoid this conflict, the best solution for this, this passenger is to get out on the deck and then the two signals are congruent. Okay? The, the, the signals from his canals and his visual system. The same thing happens when you're driving in a car. Okay? You often get car sick. And the easiest way to get car sick is sit in the back seat of a car and read a book. Okay? Because there your your, your visual system tells you you're not moving because the the, the 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 book is moving with you. Okay? But your visual system says you are. The best way not to get car sick is to sit in the front of the front seat of the car and look out the front window. Because again, the two signals are congruent there. Now, 
you get car sick. But then often that's accompanied by the feeling of nausea and worse. And what, 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 what one theory of what's happening is the brain in terms, interprets it, this conflict, conflicting system, as it's been poisoned. And it's got to get rid of this poison. And the best way it can get rid of this poison is by vomiting. Okay. That clears the poison from your stomach. So that's the, one of the theories of why um, dizziness produces uh, a sense of nausea. Now, what does adjust the gain of your view? What we said, often it's not perfect. And how does it maintain it to be as close to one as possible? Um, you can often notice that when, when you have changed the prescription of your, your glasses, when you change perception of your glasses, especially a big change, you often feel unstable and, and dizzy. So normally, if, uh, if you're walking like this um, and uh, had no, an abnormal VOR, Every time you took a step, the world that, that you're looking at would slip on your retina. So if the VOR wasn't perfect, it would, this is what, what the world would look like when you were walking or jogging. You'd have difficulty standing. But with a, a, a normal VOR, you can see gradually this VOR learns to stabilize itself. It gets adjusted. And this can happen very quickly. So it can adjust itself in a couple of hours. And what's the, the reflex that does this? Well, the, re the structure that does this is this structure called the cerebellum. That sits underneath the back of the head. And you have two pathways. One is the direct pathway, the one we talked about uh, just now in, 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 in the, about the VOR. And it, again, the vestibular nucleus, the motor neuron, the muscle. But the eighth nerve, besides heading up to the vestibular nucleus, goes up as mossy fibers, the synapse onto cells that form parallel fibers. These fi parallel fibers, in turn, synapse on this thing called a Purkinje cell. Now, this diagram doesn't do the system justice because these Purkinje cells are like a, a, a tree branch, but flattened out. So there's many, 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 many branches here. And this parallel fiber is not just a single parallel fiber, but there's many mossy fibers and they're all making synapses with some, some little uh, part of this Purkinje tree. And there's many of these Purkinje cells, and they're all connecting in various ways to these Purkinje cells. Now, okay. The, an important structure in modifying this reflex is this climbing fiber input. And that climbing fiber input comes from the eye, the retina. And it gets activated by an error in the system. And the error of the system is retinal slip. Whenever there's retinal slip, you know the VOR is imperfect. Okay. So whenever there's retinal slip, we get activation of these climbing fibers. And what happens is that you're turning, and that activates the, uh, a canal and, and the, the, the saffron here. And you can see this climbing fiber input, 
and this parallel fiber input hitting one another, colliding with one another. So they're, 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 they're arriving at this Purkinje cell at the same time. And we saw that when signals arrive at the same time, the synaptic strength changes of that connection. And so that's what allows teaching to occur in the system. So this climbing fiber is the teacher of which one of these parallel fibers should be changed in terms of its connection onto the Purkinje cell. So the steps then in uh, changing um, this, 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 is first of all, um, something goes wrong with your VOR. All through life, you can't keep a perfect VOR. These muscles change, some of these neurons die, your hair cells get affected. So you have to keep adjusting it. So when something goes wrong, then of course the first thing that'll happen is that things will start slipping on the back of your eye, like that person jogging himself earlier in the scene here. Okay. That then will activate your climbing fibers, and at the same time, at the same time as when you're moving. And the ones, the climbing fiber that coincides with the right parallel fiber, at the at the same time, gets modified. Okay? So you have a direct pathway and you make changes in this indirect pathway. And when you make the change that's sufficient, the retinal slip will go away. And that signals to the brain that everything is back to perfect again. And it stops the cerebellum, stops modifying the reflex. So it's, it's a very simple process. Now the same circuit is used to modify all kinds of uh, reflexes, okay? not just the VOR. And it is what uh, allows you to have all kinds of motor skills and uh, balance skills and a variety of other, other skills that uh, um, are, are being taught by the system. So it, it, it's, you think of the cerebellum as a, a repair shop that adjusts your reflexes and keeps them uh, as close to perfection as possible. Okay, that's it for today.